bang this hearing to an opening. Good morning. I am Chief Administrative Law Judge Charles Rainey. Can everybody hear me? Okay. All right, I'll start over again. Good morning. I am Chief Administrative Law Judge Charles Rainey, and I ask that everyone turn off their cell phones or put them on vibrate. I call to order this en banc hearing on alternative rate making methodologies at docket number M 20152518883. This is a non-adversarial proceeding for the purpose of taking testimony from experts on the efficacy and appropriateness of alternative rate-making methodologies, such as revenue decoupling. This hearing is being video streamed live on the Commission's website, and it is being transcribed by a court reporter and recorded. Interested persons are welcome to submit written comments after this en banc hearing no later than March the 16th, 2016, for the commission to consider for the purpose of reviewing the efficacy and appropriateness of alternative rate making methodologies. Submissions may be sent to the Secretary, Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission, P.O. Box 3265 Harrisburg, Pennsylvania 17105. A few housekeeping matters before we start. For those in hearing room one, please take note of the exits in case of an emergency. Restrooms are located on the atrium level near the cafeteria. At this time, I call upon Chairman Brown, Vice Chairman Place, Commissioners Whitmer, Coleman, and Powelson for any opening remarks which they would like to make. Good morning, Chairman, Vice Chairman, and Commissioners. Good morning. Thank you, Judge Rainey. I do have a few opening comments. Just want to welcome everyone that is here today and uh, thank all of you for coming into Harrisburg to testify about the, with this very important hearing. Uh, we look forward to your comments on the topic that the Commission is broaching at this very opportune time, alternative rate making. At a high level, it appears that alternative forms of rate making may help empower utility management to make decisions based on items they can effectively manage. Items such as capital cost, labor cost, and an operational expense are all within the control of the utilities. On the other hand, things like weather, economic growth, and appliance efficiency are not within their control. Yet all of these items have an impact on the financial conditions of the Pennsylvania utilities under our existing rate making construct. Rate making strategies that emphasize utilities' accountability for their costs within co their control may foster achievement of operational excellence as utilities will have less concern about adverse financial results from items truly out of their control. Further, as energy efficiency programs continue to evolve, I believe we may be placing utilities in an untenable and contradictory position of promoting measures that reduce their own resources. In holding this en banc proceeding, we hope to educate ourselves <coughs> on alternative forms of rate making and whether it can assist the commission in reconciling these concerns, helping to align utilities commissioned with utility mission with energy efficiency and distributed generation policy goals. So it is for these very reasons that this commission has called this hearing. <clears throat> There's no panacea for all these challenges. However, it is always prudent to continue to evaluate our regulatory framework for prudency as utility markets evolve. So with that, I will open it up to my colleagues for remarks. And the first one being Commissioner Powson. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and uh, I think Judge Rainey set it up nicely. It's nice to be in a non-adversarial position here this morning, Judge. This isn't an Eagles football game, right? Yes. <laughs> well, I think the, the Chairman um, and I share a lot of the, the same sentiment here, and, and, and today's hearing really gives us as commissioners an opportunity to not only look back at the success of Act 129, 
but to look ahead in terms of where we need to be headed as a state. And I remind everybody in 2008, when the construct of Act 129 came together, we were in a $14 per MMBTU gas market. We were transitioning to electric competition here in Pennsylvania and two of our major electric distribution company networks of PPL and Pico. And you fast forward now to 2016, where we have $2 per MMBTU gas, a fully competitive uh, electricity market with over 2.1 million customers out in the market. And now phase three implementation of Act 129 programs, where we've seen tremendous success, not, in, not only in terms of cost benefit, but the, the, the customer engagement around energy efficiency. And for me personally here this morning is what I worry about is how do we sustain those programs to the chairman's point of where we're asking the electric distribution company to tell their customers to use less of their product, but we as regulators want to continue to harness and promote E and C programs across the state. So for me here this morning, um, I guess I'll use the D word, the word I'm looking for, what I want to get educated on, is the benefits of decoupling uh, in a post-Act 129 world uh, that we're in today. So again, I, I appreciate uh, you all taking the time out of your hectic schedules to be with us here. I think Pennsylvania does have a truly great success story, not only in terms of our, our full transition to electric choice and, and now uh, work being done around kickstarting our electric gas market, with Act 129 programs that customers are embracing, and you couple that now uh, with today's discussion, and I think it puts Pennsylvania, hopefully, in the spotlight of other states uh, that have adopted uh, decoupling and, and the benefits that decoupling has brought in, in an EENC world. I'd be remiss also this morning in not thanking um, our Emerging Leaders Program, as I understand it, who was instrumental in helping pull this panel for us, to, excuse me, for pulling today's en banc hearing together. And I look forward to hearing your presentations here this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Powelson. If there are no other opening remarks, we will turn it back over to Chief Judge Rainey. Thank you, Chairman, Commissioners. Oh, Commissioner Cole. That's uh, thank you, Chairman. But I just uh, I'll be brief. I know we want to get on with the the main event this morning, but I uh, I just wanted to also take a, a quick moment and thank all of our panelists uh, for coming this morning. And I also want to uh, acknowledge and commend Commissioner Powson. This was uh, this was his brainchild, and so I want to make sure that we uh, we give him credit this morning uh, for uh, this proceeding. <clears throat> You know, I think the, the challenge for all of us, and, and I think Commissioner Paulson really set this up well, uh, how do we cover the fixed cost of the regulated community in a world where customers are using less and less of a product? Uh, and so I think this commission over time has clearly demonstrated uh, creativity and flexibility when you consider some of the uh, tools that we have added to the toolbox over time, whether it's a future projected test year or it's a disk mechanism. So this morning, I think we have an opportunity to explore other tools to be considered in rate making. So uh, again, I want to thank all of you for coming in a full house today. So we're looking forward to, uh, to your comments. And uh, again, thank you all for being here this morning. Thank you, Chairman Brown. Thank you, Commissioner Coleman. <clears throat> Any further? Comments, I will now turn it over to Chief Judge Rainey. Thank you, Chairman and Commissioners. We will receive the testimony of expert witnesses in two panels this morning. The Commission provided the expert witnesses with a list of questions to guide today's discussion and required the expert witnesses to provide written testimony. Their written testimony was previously submitted and it may be found on the Commission's website. For those here in hearing room one, copies of some testimonies may be found on the table as you enter this room. Time permitting, we will have a break between the two panels. Witnesses must refrain from discussion of any matters that are the subject of a contested proceeding currently pending before the commission. I ask that each witness speak slowly and clearly 
into the microphone <laughs> so that the testimony and presentations may be accurately transcribed. All previously submitted written testimonies, PowerPoint presentations, and other documents of the witnesses have been marked by me for identification as either statements or exhibits and are admitted into the record of this proceeding along with commission exhibit number one, which is a listing of the marked documents. I have provided to the court reporter a copy of all of the statements and exhibits for entry into the record. For the sake of time, the witnesses are asked to summarize or highlight their written testimony. For those witnesses who will give PowerPoint presentations today, please, while presenting, identify the content and number of each PowerPoint slide so that the transcript of this proceeding is clear. The witnesses are to proceed in the order that they appear on the agenda and are seated. The witnesses are to state their name, title, for whom they are employed, and on whose behalf they are appearing in this proceeding. The witnesses is to then proceed with his or her testimony. Each witness will be afforded 10 minutes. Attorney Chris Brown is keeping the time. We will use a machine with lights to keep time today. If there are any technical difficulties with the machine, with the lights, we have flashcards. When a witness has two minutes left, a yellow light will come on or a yellow card will be flashed. And when a red light comes on or a red card is flashed, that means stop. The commissioners will have the opportunity to pose questions after each panel. We will now proceed with the testimony of the first panel. Dr. Lari, you are the first witness in the first panel. Thank you, sir. My name is Mark uh, Newton Lowry, and I am the president of Pacific Economics Group Research. And my testimony today is sponsored by the Natural Resources Defense Council. The NRDC has asked me to prepare uh, testimony on ways that alternative regulation can be used to encourage high levels of demand-side management. I prepared a white paper especially for this proceeding in addition to the remarks I'm giving here now. In the paper, I discuss a number of shortcomings of the traditional cost of service approach to regulation in a world where high levels of demand side management are an important policy goal. One of these problems is the throughput incentive that exists under legacy rate designs, uh, which basically means that uh, the, comp the company gets more of a boost to its revenue than it takes a hit on its cost when use of its system increases. And this tends to discourage utilities from embracing the full array of demand side management opportunities. Uh, a related problem is that utilities are going to be reluctant to experiment with time of time sensitive usage charges, uh, the, which they're not sure how their uh, fixed costs will be recovered uh, in a world of volatile demand. Another problem is the weak incentive that utilities have to use demand side management as a cost management tool. This isn't always a problem under utility regulation, but it is under certain circumstances, such as, for example, when there are frequent rate cases where many costs flow through cost trackers or formula rates. And of course, private enterprise in general is insensitive to the environmental impact of uh, its operations as a general rule. These problems clearly exist here in Pennsylvania. 
Uh, there are more frequent rate cases today due in part to the emergence of declining average use uh, by residential commercial customers of electric utilities. There is also use of cost trackers uh, for uh, distribution costs and uh, formula rates at the FERC. My paper provides an extensive discussion of various uh, alt-reg tools that are potentially useful in solving these problems. One of the most important conclusions of my work is that revenue decoupling is decidedly preferable to its alternatives as a means of eliminating the throughput incentive. A big advantage of decoupling is that it removes the throughput incentive completely for the full array of initiatives that a utility can undertake to encourage demand side management, including time sensitive rates and miscellaneous efforts to transform energy markets without necessarily involving high levels of utility expenditures. The alternative approaches do not make this claim. For example, lost revenue adjustment mechanisms have high computational costs that tend to limit them to traditional utility demand side management programs, thereby leaving the throughput incentive as a problem for all the other things that utilities can do to encourage DSM. Straight fixed variable rate designs require high usage charges and I'm sorry, it require high, higher charges for low use customers and low usage charges that discourage customers from adopting DSM. Because of these limitations, it is rare for utility commissions to fully implement straight fixed variable pricing. They typically uh, end up with some sort of a modified fixed variable pricing that is not fully effective at eliminating the throughput disincentive. Revenue decoupling also has other benefits, uh, such as the reduction in revenue risk of the utility and an ability to provide automatic and reasonable rate adjustments for certain attrition problems that utilities face, such as declining average use and gradual growth in system capacity. This thereby permits a reduction in the frequency of rate cases that reduces regulatory cost uh, and more than makes up for the modest cost of actually operating decoupling mechanisms. These benefits of decoupling help to explain why it is widely used even in states where utilities don't have large DSM programs. While decoupling is the best way to eliminate the throughput incentive, uh, it is not a, a full panacea for the incentive problems that utilities face. In particular, it does not provide a positive incentive to use demand side management as a cost containment tool. The, my, the most widely used remedy for this problem is demand side management performance incentive mechanisms, uh, and these are used today in roughly half of all states, uh, retail jurisdictions in the United States. They are even used in many cases where the regulatory system also includes revenue decoupling. An emphasis of my testimony that, that is not found in, the, uh, in my fellow panelists' testimony is the use of multi-year rate plans as another way of encouraging demand side management. In these plans, there is a multi-year uh, uh, rate case moratorium and revenue escalation that occurs between rate cases is to the extent possible not linked to the comp company's own cost growth. This produces a generally stronger incentives to contain cost, including capital expenditures. Uh, th this approach uh, has long been used to regulate utilities in New York and California, and its use is growing in the United States. Uh, overseas, the use of multi-year rate plans is much more common, and a good example, a popular example, is the so-called RIO approach to regulation that is used by Ofgem uh, to regulate utilities in Britain. 
In sum, the, the state of the art today in encouraging demand side management is to combine a multi-year rate plan with revenue decoupling and demand side management PIMs that are designed to embrace not only conventional utility DSM programs, but uh, uh, demand response programs and general efforts to transform energy markets. That concludes my remarks, and thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Dr. Laurie. Mr. Sedano? Good morning. My name is Richard Sedano. I live in Providence, Rhode Island. I work with the Regulatory Assistance Project, a nonprofit based in Montpelier, Vermont. I am responsible for RAP's U.S. programs. RAP also has offices in Europe, China, and India. I previously served as commissioner for the Vermont Department of Public Service and before that held engineering staff positions there. And I'm happy to say I began my career as an engineer in power generation with Philadelphia Electric Company. RAP works with governments on challenging en energy policy matters and we write about what we expect decision makers will be needing to think about now and in future years. Uh, we often provide direct advice to state PUCs and we never appear as advocates. In this work of technical assistance to states, we are supported by U.S. Department of Energy, U.S. EPA, and foundations. I'm here today because you asked me to come, and I'm not representing anyone. Uh, I'm supposed to have a, a slide deck up, so if we can see that. I've just uh, introduced myself. I'm now going to go to slide two. On the issue of decoupling in recent times, RAP has been asked by the PUCs of Minnesota, Missouri, and New Mexico to facilitate public discussions and learning sessions for them and their communities. Slide three, uh, we have written a lot on the throughput incentive and solutions for it because, slide four, it goes to the core of how utilities are motivated to operate and invest. If utilities are financially motivated by their business environment to increase sales and to resist sales reductions, it is likely they will. Slide six. A good solution would neutralize this motivation while leaving the utility delivery revenues roughly as they would have been with frequent revenue investigations. Slide seven. Decoupling is just a mechanism, not a rate. Decoupling adjusts prices to reconcile revenues to a target. They target revenue, the target revenue is a choice and can reflect many or few forecasted events. As uh, Dr. Lowry said, uh, multi-year rate plans are consistent with this. So we see on the left, uh, traditional regulation, price, the blue line, is a rock solid between rate cases, while revenues, the green line, departs from anticipated revenues depending on uh, events for many possible reasons. On the right, now we're on slide 11, uh, the generic decoupling mechanism sticks to target revenue, as you can see here, the red line, while prices in green change to reconcile the revenues to the target. Slide 13, the calculation is simple and no change to target revenue is required. Slide 14, some states with decoupling allow the target revenue to change based on the number of customers. This is called revenue per customer uh, decoupling. In this case, as you see here, the number of customers has gone up by 500. The original revenue case calculated a revenue per customer of $50. This wrinkle raises the target revenue proportionately and price is adjusted to match. Still simple. Slide 16. There is no effect on rate design from decoupling. Slide 17. There are increasingly compelling reasons for states to reconsider the design of electricity prices. Addressing the throughput incentive does not need to be won. Slide 18. This chart is drawn from data from an actual utility to show how the throughput incentive is particularly impa impactful to net income. Gross effects on revenues of 1 to 2 percent have an outsized effect on mar margins, as you see on the right side of the slide. Slide 23. RAP staff has studied decoupling, and we find it has many advantages. These advantages have attracted many states to deploy it. Clearing the path to effective utility-run energy efficiency programs is a key motivation cited in orders. Slide 25. 
Decoupling presents drawbacks. The most frequently cited is the appearance of single issue driven rate changes and the transparency value of periodic rate investigations. Slide 26. Summarizing how decoupling differs from traditional regulation, decoupling sets a revenue path and rates are allowed to vary to stay on course, while conventional regulation sets prices. Slide 29, there are many di different variations of decoupling. Here is a selection of choices regulators are asked to make in decoupling plans. Each would take a while to talk about and are addressed in RAP's reports, which are exhibits in this case. And in my written submission also, and I invite questions on these. Slide 31, some proposed solutions might look attractive but are different from decoupling and quite different in effect on throughput incentive. Slide 32, a rate design that uh, recovers all embedded costs in the monthly customer charge is also effective at addressing the throughput incentive, but has significant collateral effects on customer prices that spill over into customer and utility investment decisions. Slide 33, a lost revenue adjustment is sometimes offered as a solution to the throughput incentive, but is not effective and has significant implementation problems, as Dr. Lowry said. Slide 35, process is important to a successful move to decoupling and represents an opportunity to articulate priorities that the mechanism can address. Slide 38, especially if customers are not used to delivery bills changing due to riders, explaining to customers the reasons for decoupling is important. Chief among them may be more effective oversight and enabling the utility to focus more on the most important tasks. Slide 39. The power industry is in a transition phase now with an increasing emphasis on customers as a resource and on services, not just delivery. The effects of the power sector on the economy and the environment are being reassessed at all scales from global to national to local. States are pivotal places where important decisions reside. Decoupling can support that transition. I leave you with this passage from an Oregon PUC order addressing the important role of the utility in engaging with customers to achieve important outcomes. And I thank you for listening to me this morning. Thank you, Mr. Sedano. Mr. Ackerman. Thank you, good morning, Madam Chairman and Commissioners. My name is Eric Ackerman. I am the Director of Alternative Regulation at the Edison Electric Institute, which of course is the trade association representing investor-owned electric utilities. I thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. And Commissioner Palson, I wanna say good morning to you because you may not remember, but a few years ago, we were our paths crossed at a Nehruk regional meeting in the context of alternative regulation. And you were a strong advocate at the time for the uh, distribution system improvement charge, so good morning. <clears throat> As you consider the appropriateness of alternative rate making methodologies, I urge you to be guided by the need to balance the desire for increased innovation on the one hand with the requirement to recover capital investments in a way that recognizes the value of the grid to all customers. The term alternative regulation or alt-reg as we talk about it in the industry connotes a set of innovative rate making policies and procedures which have evolved over the last 10 to 15 years in response to a paradigm shift in the investor-owned business, investor-owned electric, electricity business. Privately financed, that is IOUs, are making capital investments in an environment of flat to declining sales. This is a paradigm shift in the sense that for most of our history, we made needed capital investments against a background of increasing sales volumes. So traditionally, those increasing uh, sales produced incremental revenues that could be used to offset the need for new financing. It allowed us to live between rate cases better. Uh, some would argue that sales growth uh, and the, the tradition of recovering fixed costs through volumetric kilowatt hour charges uh, for residential and small business customers were design features, were fundamental design features of the original regulatory compact. Whether you accept that or not, uh, it's certainly the case that we don't have sales growth today, but we still need to make major capital investments in, in infrastructure of all kinds 
to ensure continued safe and reliable operations. As a result, our interest coverages and our credit ratings are far more sensitive to the impact of any delay in recovering costs and rates. And this is where Alt-Reg comes in. This is why it was developed and why it's been accepted so broadly. Alt-Reg uh, innovations such as forward-looking test years, and I'm mindful that uh, Pennsylvania has a fully projected test year, capital trackers of all kinds, decoupling, revenue decoupling, formula rates and multi-year rate plans all share the characteristic that they allow the utility to recover increased costs without going through a rate case every time you have a cost increase. So it lets utilities keep up with, with costs. So Alt-Reg is adaptive regulation, essentially. And I would certainly agree that the distribution system improvement charge, uh, which has been pioneered here in Pennsylvania, is certainly an example of Alt-Reg in action. So, in 2008, and again in 2014, EEI joined with the Natural Resources Defense Council in recognizing that customers are using the grid in new ways and that because of this, new regulatory policies are needed. They are needed to ensure the fair and adequate recovery of costs incurred to build and maintain the grid, but they're also needed to provide utilities increased flexibility to meet customers' changing needs. In 2008, the focus of our concern was on the need for new aggressive policies to support um, a nationwide energy efficiency campaign. We joined with NRDC in recommending three kinds of regulatory policies. A regulatory mechanism that provides cost recovery for prudent utility investments uh, in energy efficiency between rate cases. That's like the DSM uh, program cost tracker. An earnings opportunity tied to verifiable, demonstrated success in delivering cost-effective energy savings. Uh, that can be through a variety of means, shared savings, uh, uh, management fees, there are a range of ways to do that. And thirdly, a mechanism that allows utilities to recoup fixed costs as power sale volumes decline. That's what we're talking about here, rev revenue decoupling. So we endorse that, we, and these are the three legs of a regulatory stool that supports aggressive energy efficiency, and we continue to support them at EEI. Increased energy efficiency remains the starting point for cost-effective strategies to reduce carbon emissions. Uh, these three legs allow utilities to incorporate energy efficiency into their core business models. So if the fundamental question in Pennsylvania is how to go beyond what you've already started in terms of efficiency and induce more, this is, we would agree, this is the way to do it. Okay. Now, by two, that's, that's the 2008 letter. By 2014, the scope of our concerns had broadened to include distributed energy resources. We recognized that new distributed technologies are providing new opportunities for customers to use the grid more effectively and efficiently. We urged regulators to view the retail electricity distribution not as a commodity business dependent on the growth in electricity usage, but as a network business. Uh, that is meeting customers' evolving service needs. The commissioner early on said, using less of the product. We are starting to view the product not as kilowatt hours, but as the network, the, the services that the network provides. That usage is increasing as we build more functionality into the grid. Um, so, we, in, two, in the 2014 letter, we urged regulators to rethink how utility costs are recovered and to consider the need for new rate designs and new approaches that balance the desire for continued innovation with the need to recover the cost of the grid. We affirmed that consistent with the principles of rate design espoused by Professor Bonbright, that you recognize too, utilities deserve assurances that the recovery of their authorized non-fuel costs will not vary with fluctuations in electricity usage, but equally that customers deserve assurances that costs will not be shifted unreasonably to them from other customers. That cost shift issue is one to pay attention to that needs to be balanced in, in, as we do this. Okay, against this background, let me address some of the specific questions posed in the Commission's uh, questions for this hearing. So, whether revenue decoupling or other similar mechanisms encourage utilities to better implement efficiency and conservation? Absolutely, we, we believe they do. Uh, but we also recognize that whether revenue decoupling 
there is a toolkit of these, of these mechanisms. And I've included, by the way, a recent survey that Mark Lowry's firm uh, prepared for us that reflects a full panoply of, of, of tools. Whether revenue decoupling is the right mechanism for a given utility in Pennsylvania uh, depends on, on looking at what other mechanisms are in place and what some of these countervailing uh, concerns might be. But in principle, allowing by assuring the recovery of costs incurred to build, operate, and modernize the grid, uh, updated rate designs supplemented with revenue decoupling free utilities to pursue aggress aggressive energy efficiency without worrying about the impact on their credit rating or the potential potential for inappropriate cost shifting. So number two, whether such rate mechanisms are just and reasonable and in the public interest, well, clearly, properly implemented, we would say they certainly are. Whether the benefits outweigh the costs, um, we, be, we believe they can with appropriate oversight, as I will elaborate. Four, uh, alignment of alternative rate mechanisms with utilities implementation. Again, that is the three-legged stool that I just described, uh, and we, we think that is the appropriate way to induce more uh, energy efficiency investment. Uh, whether benefits exceed associated <coughs> costs. Here, uh, I w two answers. Uh, in the context of performance incentive mechanisms, you know, explicit incentive mechanisms that are going to be designed, they should be designed, the, the assurance of a net benefit should be the, the design criterion so that you, uh, the incentive should be large enough to motivate utility performance, but not so large as to exceed the benefits for customers. So that's, that's obvious for a, a PIMS design. For these other mechanisms, uh, the commission should monitor the impacts in terms of uh, parameters such as energy savings, peak load management, rate volatility, and possible cost shifting. So, you know, the, the commission needs to maintain oversight over time, I'd say. Uh, whether there is an optimal mechanism for energy efficient conservation, no. I don't think we, we our view is that uh, there's so much variation among utilities and legal uh, frameworks that they, the alt-reg uh, strategy needs to be fit uh, custom fit to each each company in its situation. Identification of best practices. Uh, again, I've uh, submitted the recent EEI survey. I've endorsed endorsed those as things to look at. Um, question on the uh, cost of capital impacts. Uh, I think uh, my colleague here alluded to that uh, in his re remarks. Uh, you should know that a number of very qualified uh, researchers have looked at this question of whether having decoupling uh, reduces a company's cost of equity, market cost of equity, and there is no empirical evidence for that. Uh, and I can provide you more detail on that if you'd like, but the Brattle Group has looked at that, NERA has looked at that, uh, researchers at Rutgers have looked at that and with different methods, with different methods, and they all have decided uh, actually, the Brattle Group said that the, their results showed, and they looked at LDCs because the data was better, uh, they, they actually statistically correlated with a little increase in cost of equity. So, sorry, my time is out. I thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mr. Ackerman. Dr. Peach. <clears throat> my name is uh, Hugh Gilbert Peach. I'm president and uh, chief science officer for H. Gell Peach and Associates. And um, I was invited here by the commission, so I'm not re representing anyone. And um, I, my testimony is going to be a little bit different because um, I study these um, decoupling mechanisms. Um, I don't advocate for them. I don't advocate against them. Uh, but I just try to study them and see how they operate. And if I were to sum them up in one word, um, it would be the same entry. If anybody's heard of the Hitchhiker's Guide for the Galaxy, the entry for Earth is one word, harmless. Um, that's because there's so many things in the galaxy that you can only have like one word for something like a planet, harmless. And I think that's the case with this uh, revenue decoupling mechanism. So let me turn to my slide two. Um, does a uh, rate decoupling mechanism encourage better energy efficiency and conservation programs? 
The answer is maybe. It is a kind of green light in the corporation, but action may or may not happen because you created the green light. Now, I'm speaking here of vanilla RDM, and in discussions in uh, California, Oregon, and Washington State, we call that um, vanilla decoupling 1.0 that removes a barrier, and that's what we're talking about today, removing a barrier. Um, generally, when we have those discussions, we talk about moving to decoupling 2.0, where there would be a pool mechanism that would reward the utility and create a, a stream of value, a payment stream, and that would pull the utility towards more, more activity. Uh, if I go to my slide three, uh, again, does the RDM encourage better energy efficiency and conservation program? Uh, sorry, thanks. The uh, Utility is a large-scale organization. They're big, and they're full of technical experts in all kinds of different areas. And they excel at just about everything they do. The technical experts who are career employees of these utilities excel at just about everything they do. Um, so let's say staff uh, knows there's a revenue decoupling mechanism. Unless they have a leadership from an officer, and unless the officer group backs the officer who cares about this, not very much will happen. Because as a former manager in a utility, I can say that one would fear to go too much before, beyond the expectations of any of the officer group. You stay within your area, your technical area, and you do the best you can. You pride yourself on your technical ability. You're there because of your technical ability but you do not exceed uh, what the officers wish. Um, so there's a nuanced effect. There's a green light. Uh, somebody's running, a, let's say, an Act 129 program, and uh, they're meeting their targets. Then they're not going to be afraid to go a little beyond the target. Uh, but they won't go very far beyond the target without an officer saying, go for it. So on my slide number four, um, what I'm saying is that it creates a neutral condition. And what really matters is the intent of the utility as an organization at the executive level. Um, I'll go now to slide six. Um, is a rate decoupling mechanism just, reasonable, and in the public interest? Yes. It's a very careful and conservative regulatory reform. It's about the hardest thing in the world to screw up if you have a good participatory part, group of parties putting it together and all interests are represented. Um, it's harmless. There's no downside. Now, some of the parties will think there's a downside and fear a downside because they're being overly theoretical. But actually, I haven't seen a downside. It removes a revenue recovery barrier and helps make the utility more accommodating to energy efficiency. And uh, that accommodation can also accommodate outside markets. You're not so worried about solar. If, if people want to put solar on their roofs, you don't really care now uh, if, you, if you're honoring the uh, RDM mechanism. So going to slide seven, in summary, there's positive benefits. No traditional cost of service class is harmed. Not the industrials, not the residential. And there are lower costs because there's fewer rate cases. So now I'll skip to my slide uh, 10. Is there an optimal rate mechanism for encouraging energy efficiency and conservation programs? Yes. Uh, sometimes called decoupling 2.0, it would have three parts. First, you take out weather normalization, so the utility is not at risk for revenue recovery for normal weather, 
uh, weatherization. And normally everybody does this now and it's just part of how it works. On top of that, you put a decoupling mechanism, decoupling 1.0, um, so that there's revenue recovery independent of sales. And then third, if you want to really move things, then you need an incentive mechanism that creates a payment stream for the utility. Um, now, I want to just say one thing off to the side that is a little bit different from decoupling, but is part of our world that we're living in, is that we need targets for utilities to upgrade their grids, and we need to create uh, revenue recovery for those capital investments. Um, the most interesting project I'm doing right now is for a utility that's um, creating a little uh, pilot with uh, solar, batteries, uh, intelligent appliances, nest thermostats, and uh, tr traditional DR all at once, and then stuffing in as much DSM as they can. I think we're going to stop talking about DSM in about two to three years. We won't call it uh, energy efficiency and conservation anymore. I don't know what we'll call it, but it's going to have generation within it. And there's also going to be some microgrids. Um, so that's where we're going, and that's why we need this uh, protection for the utilities so that they can do the upgrades on the grid and also uh, to make it ready to, be, to interconnect all these things that are going to happen on the customer side. I'm going to skip to my slide 13. Does decoupling discourage customer energy conservation? Um, and the reason why, theoretically, it could is that um, if you use less energy, then the, at the time the decoupling adjustment for the next year comes around, you get a higher per unit charge. But as it turns out, as you can see in my diagram, the yellow there represents the uh, per unit uh, charge. And it's about 2% in the cases that I have studied. Um, the highest I've ever seen is 5%. Um, usually it's much lower than 2%. So it's not enough to change motivations. Now, on slide 14, some parties will say that uh, there are potential harms from a rate decoupling mechanisms. But I don't believe, and I, I respect that, but I don't believe there are any actual harms. I think there are harms in the environment, but they don't come from decoupling. In the low-income area, um, sometimes there'll be a segment of low-income homes that use more energy than other customers and um, are unable to stop doing that while other customers who are more well-to-do make investments and, get lo and uh, lower their energy use. And uh, a low income, a portion of the low income people can be um, left out and have to pay higher prices. But I think that's just normal. That's the way the system works. Anyway, the same thing would happen during a normal rate adjustment. It's just that, decoupl that decoupling makes things show up quicker. Um, so um, let me uh, sl go to my slide 17. Um, for a summary, okay, it's very small effects uh, it's within the existing skill sets and technical scope of the utility and very doable. Thank you. That's my remarks. Thank you, Dr. Peach. I believe that concludes the testimony and PowerPoint presentations from the first panel. Chairman Brown, commissioners, any questions for the first panel? Uh, thank you, Judge Rainey. I will recognize Commissioner Palson for any questions. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and, and thank you, panelists here this morning. You know, as we develop a record here this morning around this issue of, and I like the term that was used, um, adaptive regulation, well said. And you look at Pennsylvania, we have a distribution system improvement charge, which is working well for both the water industry, now electric and gas. We have long-term infrastructure plans created. So we've created those regulatory incentive mechanisms for our utilities to, to I'll call it, make the next-gen T&D investment. Um, 
Now comes the customer, and the customer that we deal with are customers that want electric choice. They hopefully will embrace gas choice. Um, they want <clears throat> um, to embrace um, things like the Nest thermostat. Um, and what, what I hear you all say, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but decoupling is a superior way or superior regulatory tool to harnessing increased demand side programs. I think that's, maybe I'm going a little off script by using the word superior, but I think unanimously you all feel that way. And what I struggle with, and I want to, this is really my question. Um, so we have a disk mechanism. So infrastructure and grid modernization is happening under the disk. Um, we uh, have a very robust statewide E and C program known as Act 129. And you've got a restructured uh, electric and gas market, so customers have retail choice. And so I, in, in bringing us all together here this morning in, quote, a non-adversarial setting, um, I just I look at your testimony, I just see nothing but upside for customers if we embrace some type of decoupling mechanism and really bring more EENC into the marketplace. And it's 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 the you know Pennsylvania. I see some some of our folk from some of our uh, companies in the in the uh, in the DR business. And uh, Pennsylvania is arguably one of the top five states in the country because of Act 129 for, for demand side programs. So let me get at this question. Um, decoupling, I look at the states that have it and the states that don't. The states that have it, there seems to be long-term stability in their E and C programs. The states that don't have it, they go through these fits and starts where these programs go dark, they come back up. And for us, I would hate to see that happen because it's going to cause a lot of fatigue, both legislatively and to all of my constituents where I live in my county and all my colleagues are all from different counties here. I mean, people are really embracing these programs. So, again, decoupling, superior regulatory tool. It's working well in other states. By the way, all of our neighbors have it. Uh, so we're kind of that outlier. So having said that, um, you know, your thoughts again, um, are, are we, I mean, we have a great foundation in place with the current, with the current construct of DISC, Act 129, but my fear is if we don't get some type of hybrid decoupling on the books, we're going to run afoul with keeping these programs alive. So your thoughts. Commissioner Pallison, um, I'm not sure what to say except yes to what you've said. Um, I think the only thing I'll, I'll say in summary then is that one of the tasks that commissions have, and I've studied a lot of commissions over a lot of years, is to try to create a, a, a business environment for the companies and an expectations for customers that is consistent. And so uh, I think one of the things that decoupling accomplishes very well is to put the utilities in a position that's very consistent with the, uh, as, as consistent as one could before you actually go into performance incentives uh, with the interests of, of customers and with the interests, overall interests of the state, considering all of the, the premises that uh, the legislature has, has sent to you on energy efficiency and conservation as well as perhaps other other uh, policy matters. So I think you know we can argue about the details, but in terms of the forest here, uh, setting up a, a, a system that's virtuous, that motivates customers and utilities in similar directions is an important role that commissions have. If they can achieve that, I think they've done a good job. Commissioner. <clears throat> I would say yes as to the decoupling as a, as a superior mechanism, but I would add to it. We certainly feel at EEI and I think in the industry that a, a high priority for adaptive regulation must also be uh, updating rates. The re legacy rate designs are maladjusted, maladapted to the world that we're moving to, a world in which the grid is the essential commodity, not kilowatt hours. So the, the, we need to reduce reliance on the kilowatt hour charge for fixed cost recovery, and when we, as we do that, a lot of these other problems get uh, become mitigated and get smaller to deal with. So, 
And uh, dare, I, dare I mention it, net metering is part of that, part, part of that regulatory agenda should be as well. We cannot, it's, it's not sustainable to, to um, credit customers at the fully bundled retail rate. That, that will cause problems as, that, as the amount of distributed energy grows. Well, you, you, you should have been in our public meeting a couple of weeks ago. We, we think we solved that problem, but. Good. <laughs> Glad to know. Could, could I just add to that, um, uh, particularly with that distributed energy, um, we need uh, pilots with, uh, where we set up little microgrids for uh, police stations, fire stations, uh, city administrations. So in, in the case of a uh, disaster or a climate uh, happening, that um, they can function independently of the grid. And the problem with that is that um, you can see all the values and you can line them up, but many of them are not monetized. Um, they're like maintaining civil order or maintaining health of a community or uh, maintaining the integrity of a government or providing fire or police services. And those aren't monetized the same way that uh, locational marginal pricing is. So uh, this is, decoupling is one of the steps along the way, but I think where we're going is and this is being led by cities and counties, not by utilities, um, is this strong interest for those kinds of customers in having um, their own generation, control of their own little microgrids. And uh, I think that's coming on the horizon. And I think this would be one good step to facilitate that. I might comment finally that uh, well, it's as discussed in my paper that uh, revenue decoupling is used in most of the states where utilities have especially large DSM programs. In other words, wherever regulatory commissions are really committed to uh, getting the most out of uh, demand side management, it's used there. It's also uh, it's been shown to encourage experimentation with rate design, such as some of the experiments in California. It's also used in both California and Hawaii, the two states with the highest level of distributed generation penetration. But remarkably, it's also used even in states uh, where most DSM is done by independent agencies because of all of the other uh, benefits uh, that it provides. Uh, and I, on, on top of all the other things that I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, I, I'll just throw in this one, that in a state that has forward test years, like Pennsylvania now has, there can be a lot of haggling about future billing determinants and a lot of games played by all parties uh, uh, to, to serve their own interests. And with revenue decoupling, uh, one of the appeals is that it simply takes that off the table because eventually you're going to be true, uh, trued up to the actual billing determinants that occur. So there's no, there's no need to uh, be haggling about uh, fu future billing determinants. And one last question, Madam Chair, if I may, um, and, and to stick with this, because we're going to hear, you know, we have two collaboratives going on right now, and my colleagues and I got debriefed. They've been really not collaborative because we didn't hear much come out of them yet, which kind of shocks me because here we are today developing this record, and we're going to hear things like, well, decoupling could, could impact our ROE. Um, but I also, just looking at all the positives, um, we reduce regulatory costs. Last time I checked, that's really good for customers, and we talked about that in our DISC mechanism and why that's good not to have a pancaking of rate cases every year. Um, we've talked about in this discussion here this morning, rate cases that could be spread out over a three to four year period, and that's one of the ingredients of our, of our DISC mechanism. Multi-year rate plans, and then I come back to the cost shifting issue, and. You know, I use the example of Hawaii. I'd love to be there right now. But um, there's a study in Hawaii uh, by the Progressive States Network says decoupling has not resulted in any significant rate increases. So, um, and, and I just share that because I'm sure we're going to hear, um, you know, it's, it's a, an eclectic group of naysayers. Um, but, w w you know, in these states that have it, we have not seen this huge panacea of cost shifting to, to these other customers. And to the low-income customers, in Pennsylvania, we have programs like CAP programs, LIHEAP, LIHERP, under a decoupling mechanism, those programs do not go away. 
So we'll hear a lot about this undue burden cost shifting to low income customers. And that's malarkey. It's just not the reality. So um, again, thank you for, for your presentations here this morning and I'll turn it back over to the chair. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Powell and Commissioner Coleman. Thank you, Chairman Brown. And, and I want to pick up on um, Commissioner Paulson's comment. Um, as I look at uh, a second panel that is about to, to uh, join us here shortly, I'm, I'm sure there's another uh, point of view on decoupling. And I want to focus back to the, the comment that Dr. Peach made about no downside um, premise. And uh, to Commissioner Paulson's comment on the low income community and the notion that that in decoupling, this is increasing the base cost for all customers. And the premise that this is, uh, this is an increased cost to the low income customers that is going to make it increasingly challenging them to be uh, able to afford to pay a bill. So can you give us uh, your perspective? And I'd be happy to hear the other panelists as well. Sure, <clears throat> sure. Uh, I've seen it happen both ways. Um, uh, in one decoupling that I studied, um, it turned out that um, the more um, well-to-do customers who are not on the low-income programs um, were able to take advantage of programs uh, where there'd be incentives, but then they would also pay in some money. And they, it was effective enough that their, their usage started to drop. If you include the low-income customers within the same cost of service class as the regular residential customers, just have one cost of service class, then those who are unable to control their energy use will be penalized uh, by the program. Um, if you were to set up two cost of service classes, one for low-income and identified members of low-income programs, and one for residential, you could probably structure it in a way that that wouldn't happen. But um, then in another one I studied, um, it turned out that actually um, the low income customers lowered their energy use more than the regular residential customers and they were not hurt. So I think it's just a case by case, and sometimes it's different from electricity and, and gas. Um, it's something that should be discussed, and uh, the, whatever advisory group or parties you have that work on these should express and figure out what's a good mechanism in case there's a problem. But um, there's not always a problem. Commissioner, I'd like to talk about this. Um, first of all, the intent of decoupling, I think, is to uh, re reflect to customers the just and reasonable costs of operating the system. There are no specific costs associated with decoupling. What can happen is that the timing of those costs uh, being seen by customers can change if the mechanism brings them forward faster. But if you had annual rate cases, you would probably get the same results. In other words, the costs that are flowing through to customers are going to flow through cust to, to customers anyway. And so in, in that respect, uh, there's nothing unjust or unreasonable about that. But there's a more fundamental thing to talk about here, and that is, does decoupling change the behavior of utilities in their investment and operations of the system? And I want to underscore investment. Uh, if by virtue of their motivation to invest in lower cost energy efficiency than higher cost system assets, then in the long run, everyone will see lower costs. Now, perhaps we are impatient about how long it takes to get to the long run, but if, we're, if we don't pay attention to the long run, we will inevitably pay higher costs forever. And so that, I, I think, is part of the, 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 the mature task of commissions, is to consider uh, those time variables and to consider how to motivate utilities toward the least cost solutions uh, in, in, in an enduring way. And so I think for low-income customers, uh, as with all customers, they will benefit from that. I think it might be unfair to ask decoupling, a decoupling mechanism specifically, to deal with a safety net issue. I think if there needs to be a safety net, you should build that and protect the people that need to be protected. Thank you. 
Thank you. And again, thank you, panelists, for joining us today. That's all I have, Chairman Brown. Thank you, Commissioner Coleman. Commissioner Whitmer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a, a general question for any of the panelists. Would we be better served um, by just simply moving the utilities out of the default role period? I'm going to say that that's, that uh, that's an interesting question. I'm going to say that uh, th these are separate questions. Uh, it, regardless of whether they have default service obligations, they, I think, will retain delivery service obligations. And I think the subject of decoupling is how efficiently and effectively over the long run they will, they will execute that responsibility. Yeah. Well, and I would just uh, repeat that uh, I don't know by the talking about the default role whether you're also talking about them getting out of the, the, the demand side management role, but in many states uh, have, have approved decoupling uh, even where the demand side management is pursued by an independent agency because of uh, partly because of all the other things that utilities can do such as their use of uh, their control of rate designs to encourage DSM. Uh, that it that it proves worthwhile to uh, to to have decoupling. Right, and I would just add that, um, as Rich said, uh, even in the scenario where the incumbent utility is not providing conservation services, they're still providing the grid, and they're still investing in a modern grid. And the financial pressures about you know that make them sensitive to to uh, too, too slow recovery still apply. So they so decoupling is still uh, it's not the only tool, but it's, it's still relevant for utilities. And I don't have anything to add to the other. Well, I might add something to, to what uh, Rich Sedano said about waiting, being patient to wait for the long run. Well, here in Pennsylvania, the long run seems to be now because so many of the utilities are engaged in accelerated modernization programs. So a lot of the, a lot of the costs that potentially could be saved from uh, high DSM uh, in the future are actually um, costs that are being incurred in the very near future. Uh, one more chair, one more question, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> in Pennsylvania, we have uh, mandatory participation in E, E, and C programs. There's some discussion about you know allowing certain classes to opt out of of those. From your perspectives, in order for um, decoupling to work, do all participants need to be forced to participate, or all customer classes need to be forced into E, E, and C programs, continuing that scenario that we have now? Well, I'll start again and say that I think, again, these are independent questions. Uh, the, the and typically this is focused on industrial customers and, and there is reason to think about industrial customers distinctly from the point of view of decoupling as my written statement points out, especially if the population of them in a utility is relatively small. Um, but I think that what we're talking about here is the motivation for utilities and if it is uh, important for utilities to encourage industrial customers to be efficient so that they don't put additional costs that would have to be paid by everyone, then whatever motivation uh, you, you impose through your regulation on utilities to accomplish that would be important. So whether it's, it's requiring efficiency programs for industrial customers or simply motivating utilities to do the best job they can with their customer relation managers with those customers to voluntarily get commitments for efficiency, whatever it takes, if that's what's in the best interest of all customers, then regulation should, should send them in that direction. So, Commissioner, in my experience, industrial customers uh, frequently are very sophisticated energy managers, and they tend to uh, look upon uh, publicly funded programs as you know, behind, behind the curve, or you know, they, they frequently, big companies feel their way ahead and, and that, that's part of why they resent having to pay uh, in rates for, for programs. Uh, and if they, if they object to a decoupling, it's because they're concerned about the potential for cost shifting to them. So my comment would be that 
this, to me, this reinforces the importance of cleaning up your rates. If you clean up your rates, you'll have less of these issues and that you should have less resistance from industrials. Um, we, we need to be sensitive to them. They're getting more and more options for leaving the system, and we don't want them to do that. So we have to, we have to uh, be sensitive to them. I just if I might make an addition, the motivations for the customer are strictly their own. They're participants in energy efficiency investment considerations, and that's as appropriate. The system in investment characteristics may be different. And so if more investment from the industrial customers generally would benefit everyone, then that's the reason for the commission to take an interest to figure out how can we motivate that? If that would benefit everyone, uh, and, and the, the industrial customers doing the job that they need to do would do less. And, and that is the typical situation, I should say, because of payback rates that are, are important to industrial customers being on the order of 12 to 24 months and cost-effective energy efficiency programs for the system being quite longer. So there's that difference. Uh, then it's up to the commission to evaluate, is that important? And if that's important to everyone, how do we motivate that to happen? I think a lot of states motivate that by requiring industrial customers. Uh, others require some sort of self-direct so that the industrial customers have to do something that they can choose themselves. And I think that's a way to try to balance the considerations that you're dealing with here. I don't actually have an opinion about whether the industrial customer should be subject to uh, participate in utility demand side uh, management programs, but I would like to underline that the coupling uh, does not have to extend to the industrial sector. Uh, manufacturing is important and part of Pennsylvania's economy, and we all acknowledge the need to have a, a thriving manufacturing sector. But uh, many decoupling plans do not extend to the large volume customers. And even when they do, sometimes they can be put in a separate basket uh, from other customers so that, for example, if there's a, a mild summer weather, that they're not hit with a, a, an increase in rates because of developments that chiefly affect the residential and commercial customers. Can I just say the state of Washington, when it addressed this, um, the industrial customers uh, asked to be removed from the decoupling mechanism that was being put in place. The commission said, you are customers, you know, you're, you're sharing the benefits and the costs of the, the grid, so you will participate. However, they let them design their own version of decoupling, and instead of decoupling based on uh, energy, it's, o it's only, it's only uh, electric decoupling I'm talking about. Instead of basing it on em energy, the industrial decided to base it on KW, and they were happy with that. Um, and that seems to be proceeding, and uh, there seems to be no adverse impacts. I think a lot of times uh, there are theoretical adverse impacts that industrials with uh, the funding to have very sophisticated uh, people working in this area can put forward in a very persuasive way that in actual practice they are not hurt by this. Now, my friend John Hughes, who's head of Elcon, would disagree with this, and uh, most attorneys for uh, large industrial would disagree with this, and I have to respect that. I think it's state by state to work it out. Mr. Ackerman, just a quick um, question. You've mentioned now a couple of times um, cleaning up our rates. What would you suggest or what types of um, ideas were, do you have in mind? Well, Commissioner, at the, uh, thank you. At the winter, uh, just uh, recent uh, NARIC winter meeting, there was a uh, report uh, from the committee that is looking at these issues generically. And we have submitted a report to them, and I'd be happy to submit it for the record by the 16th. Uh, things, there's a whole menu of things. Uh, you know, at EEI, we do not take a position on what's the right new rate design. Clearly, that is a matter for states to, to decide with their, with their companies in view of local circumstances, et cetera. But there is a generic list, a, a menu. 
And the, the, so the things that we described for, for Nehruk, and I'll be happy to share, demand charges, buy all, sell all arrangements, uh, fixed monthly charges, time varying rates, capacity charges, installed capacity fees, DG output fees, interconnection fees, minimum bills, standby rates. There are many ways to slice a cat. Vice Chairman, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you very much for your testimony today. Um, to your, getting to your point about slicing the cat. Um, several of you, Dr. Lowry, uh, Mr. Zudinio, Mr. Ackerman, reference uh, in your testimony performance incentive measures. Um, can you elaborate on how we avoid that being a blunt instrument? Uh, do we? Can you speak to specifics of what has worked well? Well, in a sense, uh, both. I, 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 all several of the witnesses uh, here have talked about the idea of a, a demand side management performance incentive mechanism, and that's certainly a popular form of PBR. Actually, the multi-year rate plan that I also discussed is is another uh, is is also falls under the heading of PBR. But let's. I think maybe your your interest is chiefly with the uh, the demand side management PIMS. And as I said, these are used in a, about half of all uh, uh, retail jurisdictions in the United States. They typically uh, reward the utility for. Uh, good performance uh, with demand side management. And there are a number of different formulas by which it can be done. Uh, it can, for example, be uh, an estimate of shared savings uh, achieved by demand side management programs, which is, is interesting because it can put the, it can, it could put the utility in the position of arguing for that there actually is value from things like demand side management and even distributed generation in terms of, uh, uh, achieving transmission and distribution cost efficiencies. Uh, it could be uh, amortization of DSM expenses. Problem with that is that some of many of the things that utilities can do to promote uh, demand side management don't involve a lot of expenses. Uh, another idea is to, per, uh, is to permit uh, utilities to keep a share of any uh, revenue from demand side management bids that they would organize for use in a bulk power market. Uh, the real challenge today is to try to get those uh, PIMs to address more than just traditional utility DSM programs. And if you follow the New York Rev proceeding, uh, look for example at uh, the staff paper, uh, track two paper that came out a few months ago on policy issues. And they talk about the struggle to use, uh, to re uh, reform demand side management PIMS so that they encourage utilities to foment market transformations that make DSM uh, work on its own without necessarily involving a lot of utility expenses. I'm happy to talk about this. Um, I think the, the opening question I have in this, in this topic is how do we know how the utility is doing? Uh, if they stay out of the newspapers and don't screw up, is that good enough? Is, and is that all we need to know? And I think that as uh, public officials, uh, I, I would like to know more than that. And so uh, I think about an enterprise-wide performance system uh, and, and this converges with what New York is, is doing, but also there are a few other commissions like uh, Hawaii that are, are thinking about this. And uh, I think this has come up now in, in the Minnesota E21 collaborative process as well, uh, to think about an array of scorecard or, me or measurements that we will keep track of. Perhaps we don't attach any rewards or penalties to those. And perhaps out of those, a small group that represents a range of things that utilities do uh, would, would have some rewards attached to them. You do have to pay attention to the game that you create when you create something like this, because if you attach money to something, all of a sudden, uh, like, like the, uh, the, the Tower of Sauron, the, the attention of everyone goes, is directed in that direction. And so uh, there's, there's an important and delicate uh, ac action that a regulator needs to think about, I think, when, when approaching this. But it is very powerful. And to think about uh, earnings that are not just for rate base, which, which may or may not 
be a good thing in, in, in all situations, but to attach that to performance, which I think has a, a knock-on benefit, to be honest with you, about uh, accountability in government. Uh, how do you, not only how do you know how the utility is doing, but how do constituents know how a utility is doing? How does an editorial writer thinking about a utility know how a utility is doing? Without some sort of system of measurement of something that's important to society, you're just basically guessing. And so this is an opportunity not just to bring uh, some, some r rigor into energy efficiency, but an, an opportunity to bring some rigor into the whole practice of regulation. I just add that um, uh, I, I can provide some uh, uh, documentation. We, I remember a monograph we did some years ago about the time of that first NRDC letter that talks about how to, uh, that, that really um, elaborates those three stools of the regulatory leg, and particularly the incentives, how to design those. There are three or four major uh, approaches, you know, shared savings with the, if measure what the, what, the, what the delivered savings are, monetize the value somehow, and, and there's a, you have an agreement up front that there's a percentage the utility will retain. Uh, management fees, um, there was at the time a very innovative proposal by one of our members for something called save a watt in which the, the um, utility would, w the commission would uh, have to agree what is the what is the avoided, the short run avoided cost, the long run avoided cost for energy supply, short run, long run. And once we get a bogey, get a, get a measure, get a value for that, uh, an agreement to pay some, some percentage of that to the utility for, de for delivered verified savings. That was another way. So there, there are a number of ways to go at it. I, I will be happy to add that to what I submit for the record. Thank you. I just wanted to say one more thing about uh, the other type of uh, PBR, which is the multi-year rate plan. And uh, evidence has shown that uh, if you can keep utility out of rate cases uh, for an, uh, an extended period, it can have a real effect on their ability to their and propensity to contain their costs. And look no further than the state of Pennsylvania for examples of that, because a number of Pennsylvania utilities uh, were out of rate cases for uh, a great many years after uh, restructuring to create bulk, uh, competitive uh, power markets. And uh, during that period, uh, Several Pennsylvania utilities ranked amongst the top productivity growth performers uh, of amongst power distributors in the United States. Um, yeah, briefly, I'm cognizant we're running short of time. Um, uh, Mr. Sitting, you mentioned inflation. How you, how you quantify? Is there an elegant uh, mechanism or approach you see to to ensuring that we're capturing inflation properly in a decoupled world? The mechanism can uh, capture many different known or expected changes to utility costs and, and build them into changes in rates in subsequent years. If you think about a three-year uh, decoupling plan, you can determine uh, assumptions about many things, including inflation, for uh, costs going into years two and three and change the, the target revenue for those and therefore the reconciliation to, to rates for those years. So this is, uh, I think what, what, this is an example of, of an easy adjustment. There are some more challenging ones to think about, uh, but it, it's also an example of how uh, manipulable the, the decoupling tool is. It, it, and I say that in a, in a constructive way. It will, you can design it to meet the needs of the state. Okay, thank you. Um, Madam Chairman. Uh, thank you. I just have a couple quick questions. I uh, want to thank my colleagues for their questions because most of the time they took all my questions. So <laughs> thank them for that. One of the, the key things, and I'll just make it as a comment that I noted in your, your testimony, and I also noted it from questions from some of the other commissioners in terms of the impact that it could have on low-income consumers. So I do thank you for all your comments. And what I got out of your comments and your testimony is that decoupling could be very beneficial, but we have to also have to make sure how we look at it as a state um, to make sure to try to minimize any impact on the low-income consumers. So that that's very helpful to me. Uh, my 
follow-up question, which I don't think was asked by any of the commissioners, so that's good. I did hear in, I think, two of your testimonies in terms of the issue of uh, weather normalization. So I just wanted to follow up a little bit more on that. We, in the last couple of winters, have had some difficult winters, um, including 2014, which impacted many of the states. So I just wanted to ask the follow-up question uh, as to weather normalization rates and how it can mitigate any weather variable, variable variability uh, concerns that a state may have or the utilities may have on this issue. This always comes up, so it's a, always a good question. Um, <laughs> My opinion about this is that if you want to take the utility's attention off of sales, then normalizing for weather is, is not the thing to do. That, that to, to allow actual sales to go into the reconciliation process is the best thing to do. And then uh, the utility uh, will, will do what it can to manage its costs uh, to, to protect against uh, variable weather. Um, it is of no great concern to, to, to the, uh, it's, it's no interest to the utility to see the kind of variability in, in rates that dramatically uh, hot summers or, or warm or, or, or cold summers would cause to rates. And this provides me with the opportunity to to talk about the anecdote that probably upset me one of the most significant while I was in office, which was a speech by a CEO hoping for a hot summer because of how it would affect utility revenues. Uh, it was not really what anybody else wanted to see happen, but it was important to sh shareholders. I think having um, a, a mechanism that, that allows the utility to, to not worry about sales entirely uh, and not nor or normalizing for weather or economic cycles or other things uh, allows the utility to manage for those events in the most effective way uh, and and keeps their focus on managing costs so so that's uh, that's how I see it I might just comment that first of all to clarify that under the coupling you have the option of including weather volatility or excluding it from decoupling. Uh, most states have what I would call full decoupling that does include in decoupling uh, the weather volatility issue. I think the rationale in a, a place like Washington State where they've excluded it is that they want to focus more on encouraging demand side management. But my own view is that it, it would be unfor it's unfortunate to do that because it discourages uh, experimentation with uh, rate designs that can promote demand side management. Think, for example, of a, uh, 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 time sensitive pricing. Now, if you're if you're going to move in the direction of time sensitive pricing, you, you know you're already going to be a little bit nervous about how cost recovery will work because you don't know how quickly people could migrate away from use of the system at the peak. And if you throw into that the fact that the use of the system at the peak, uh, you know, goes up and down with uh, severe summer weather, for example, uh, there's all the more risk of of using this this new tool that the AMI makes possible that can uh, really uh, have an impact in the long run on capital spending and customer costs. Madam Chairman, I, we don't have a position at EEI in the industry on this question, so I would say, uh, I would, uh, say it's important to work with your utilities and, and be explicit about, whichever way you go, be explicit about what is, it, what is the public interest you're encouraging and, and what, what, be explicit about the incentives you're putting into place. Madam Chairman, um, I would be I would take a somewhat different perspective in that I think weather adjustment uh, belongs in in rates, so the utility is uh, protected from changes in the weather, and I think that's step one. Then step two is decoupling 1.0, which is the subject of this uh, meeting today, and then step three is an incentive for the utility to help pull them. Uh, after you after you, after you, after you get the barrier out of the way and make things neutral, then you've got to uh, pull them. And to pull them, you have to make it uh, create a revenue stream that the officer group feels is reliable and strong. So I'd put it together that way. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, Judge Rainey, I believe we are exactly on time. We are exactly on time. So we will turn Chairman. it back over to you. Yes. Well, I'd like to thank the first panel for their testimony here today and their presentations. And you may all stand down. We will be in recess for 15 minutes so that we will return at 10.45 a.m. for the second panel. Thank you very much.